And now, an eighth special presentation. This time on Art Beat Nation. A classic Jane Austen novel is brought to life with a new musical. Musicals are these unbelievable, magical, theatrical events. A 20th century Swedish painter is rediscovered. I would um, describe him as, a, as one of the most important precursors of, of modern art. Harley Davidson celebrates its 110th anniversary. People get a connection to Harley Davidson that goes beyond just the tangible. And we understand how a composer created his art. Marvin was one of the few musicians that could cross from Broadway to Hollywood to the concert stage. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you. Sense and Sensibility staged its premiere at the Denver Center for Performing Arts in early 2013. The classic Jane Austen tale tells the story of the Dashwood sisters as they experience romance and heartache. Watch as the show's cast and crew reveal what it was like to work on the production. It's a big monster. It's, it's so exciting. Musicals are these unbelievable, magical, theatrical events. The director's job at best should be invisible, but during the process, I guess you could equate it to the captain of the ship. I make sure I hire the right crew, that everybody is working towards a common goal, and I bring my expertise at staging and creating relationships and behavior that uh, make the actors come alive and live truthfully under these imaginary circumstances. Songs function in a variety of ways. We define ourselves by the objects that we attach to, that we hold important, and by the things that we want. We always said one was incomplete without the other. There are songs called I Am Songs and I Want Songs. And the I Am Songs tells us who the character is. It explains their kind of innermost feelings about things. The I Want Song is what they want. The role I play in Sense and Sensibility, the musical, is Eleanor Dashwood. And she represents duty and propriety and honor and obligation to family. Marianne is the romantic sister. She flies off the handle. She thinks with her heart. She doesn't use her brain a lot. But she's very young and so she's learning sort of that love can be quiet and sensible and patient and it doesn't have to always be passionate and poetry and the lust side of love. You know just as I think people have been having sex for many years, you know, we can't pretend that people don't have physical desires and physical needs. And so there's nothing wrong with celebrating that, and that may seem contemporary. I'm not trying to push it to a naughty place or anything like that. I'm just saying that humans are who they are, whether it's 1810 or it's 2013. I didn't want to write completely in the period the way Jane Austen writes because uh, it's, it's a little thorny and on stage you only get to hear things once. So the lyrics, the dialogue have to be accessible enough to a modern audience. It seems like we can really identify the period through furniture and through some of the physical production. I tend to like to use as much real stuff as I can. One thing that is less of a concern is that here in, in Denver there are uh, quite talented craftspeople to actually build the furniture, because I'm, I'm sort of obsessive about um, period detail and about furniture. Well, it matters. It, if, if you're telling a story that takes place in a certain time and that's the point, you want it to be right. You don't want it to be fake. Yeah, because you don't want the actors looking at some shabby piece of furniture. Right. And the same with clothes. They want to wear the actual mm -hmm. clothes. Costume-wise, too, we're using the Regency silhouette, but Emilio Sosa, who's also a fashion designer and a Project Runway all-star, he knows fabric and he knows something that's going to give it a little more interest and relatability. And I'm doing that by dressing them accordingly to the character. 
So I think the clothing is the final touch for an actor. Where I'm bringing a little spin in it is the color combinations. We've chosen to really ump the palette just to give it a more contemporary edge, but the silhouette is still very traditional to the period. Good musical theater should make you really feel something. The beauty of telling a story in this way is that we're showing that when we can no longer speak, we sing, and we can no longer sing, we dance. There's so much more we can say with our bodies that we can't say through words because language is limited, and that's why I do musical theater. That's why I love musical theater. It's so rewarding. Sense and Sensibility is probably the most romantic piece of theater that I've ever worked on. Musical theater wants to illuminate the human spirit in some way, and I think it wants to be a good yarn. I think it wants to tell a great story. This art form is the way I express myself, so I always like to say that I have no talents when it comes to uh, painting. I do like stick figures, but what is so exciting and the gift that I've been given and also worked on for my life is using this to, to connect with people. Jason. Up that way. Yeah, so you know, the word artist is a very profound uh, description, and I rarely use it about myself. I like to aspire to be an artist, and I hope that my work makes a little art, but it's not something I think about. It's a little intimidating. 20th century painter Anders Zorn was an artistic star from an early age whose talent was pursued across continents. But unlike his contemporary John Singer Sargent, Zorn's fame was short-lived. Until now. Jared Bowen explains. With his bathers, the water ripples and shimmers. The women are luminescent. In his portraits, the fabrics are pools of light. The faces, the eyes, lure you in, and it's tough to step away. In a word, says curator Oliver Tostman, Anders Zorn is seductive. It's a very sensuous style. I mean, the, the colors are deep. You, he, you can see the brush strokes. It's, it's just, there's a certain physicality about it, which, which is that, just there. Then if you look at the, uh, at the society portraits, he always slightly embellishes his sitters. He, he wants to, to render them as attractive as possible. There was a moment, roughly the span of the 1890s, when Swedish painter Anders Zorn held the art world in his palm. Highly collected and commissioned, he was an international superstar, says Tostman, curator of the first Zorn show in this country in almost 30 years. On view at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, the show, like the artist himself, is a revelation. I had barely any uh, idea about Anders Zorn. And when I looked closer at the collection, it, uh, I was just stunned about the variety of his works, but also the quality. A superstar who faded into obscurity, Zorn began as a painter as adept at commerce as he was with the canvas, marketing himself to patrons, seduced by his style. I would um, describe him as, a, as one of the most important precursors of, of modern art. He somehow prepared the grounds for that. His work captured the attention of Isabella Stewart Gardner at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. She collected and befriended Zorn, and the two would develop an enduring friendship, as evidenced by the surviving letters he wrote her. It was very joyful, uh, very witty. He tries to stimulate her intellectually. He tells her about his life, which was peripatetic. He tells her about his art projects. He, he sends her little presents. His most lasting gift is perhaps this portrait of Mrs. Gardner, which she cherished with prominent placement in her homes. He has this unique talent to connect with the sitters and to get something of their personality. If you look at our portrait of Isabella Stewart Gardner, it's just fascinating. I mean, she was a 54-year-old 50, woman at that point, and, and, and he somehow renders her totally ageless. By Zorn's own admission, this painting of an ice skater, unusual in that she's depicted at night, was among his dearest. She appears instable, and there is something with these long shadows casted on the eyes, something, something nearby haunting. As lasting as Zorn's work would be, he faded with history. A slow disappearance that began when he removed himself from Europe's thriving art circles toward the end of his life. Paris and his patrons there, his friends, 
fellow artists there had a huge impact on him. And they forced him to try out things, to experiment, to push himself. When he moved from Paris, he became a little bit more um, complacent, if you want to say, a little bit repetitive. But history also repeats, and with the Gardner Show, Zorn is reborn. To learn more, visit GardnerMuseum.org. Harley-Davidson is the oldest American motorcycle company. To celebrate its 110th anniversary, the Harley-Davidson Museum in Milwaukee, Wisconsin gives us a tour. Watch as the curator of the museum explains how this motor vehicle is more than just a machine. People get a connection to Harley-Davidson that goes beyond just the tangible. Of course, these are motorcycles, they're transportation vehicles, but there's something that goes a lot further beyond just the use of the vehicle. My name is Kristen Jones and I'm the senior curator for the Harley-Davidson Museum. The museum came together in 2008, that's when we opened our doors to the public, but the idea for the museum has been around for much longer than that. The, the collection of the Harley-Davidson archives has been around since the 19-teens and we have an extensive collection that ranges from the earliest days of the motor company from 1903 to the present time. There's so much here for people to enjoy. Um, some of my particular favorites are the earliest catalogs, uh, some of the galleries that talk about the founding of the company with serial number one, the oldest known Harley Davidson. We have a lot of things that also talk about the culture of riding and the cultural history of riding. Some of my personal favorites are the club uniform jerseys. We also have a lot of different personal stories that we tell in the museum, things about different writers. For instance, a young woman who in 1929 took a solo trip from Georgia to Milwaukee and back. Her name was Vivian Bales, and we have a lot of materials that talk about her story and her personal experience being a young woman on the road alone. This year for the anniversary, we've done a special exhibition entitled Designing a Celebration, and this gives people a behind-the-scenes glimpse into the development of the logos that we use for the celebration and also some of the special products. We do a limited edition motorcycle for each anniversary, and it's a very special piece, highly collectible, and we gave people a glimpse into the design and engineering of that product. There's a real cultural significance to Harley-Davidson, as most of us know. And a lot of that comes from the ideas of personal freedom, the idea of being out on the road, the idea of camaraderie. All of those things are kind of enveloped within our machines. But personalization is also a big deal for Harley Davidson, and that's something I think that resonates with people. We have motorcycles that are highly personalized here, and they range from people who've added just a few things to things that are really rolling sculpture. One of my favorites is the King Kong motorcycle, and this is a double-engine knucklehead vehicle that really is unlike anything I've ever seen before. It's something that was done by a gentleman out in Pennsylvania. He was a real folk artist and created this vehicle to ride it in parades. There are a lot of classic motorcycles here that were used by different personalities. In fact, we have a replica piece from Evil Knievel. Some of the other more familiar bikes that people will see is Captain America from Easy Rider. When someone comes to the museum, they can take their own path. They can really decide what they want to see and when. We have, of course, a chronological display of all the motorcycles, but we also have historical galleries that really put Harley Davidson in the big picture context of what's happening in American culture at the time. Some of the things that they definitely shouldn't miss, of course, are the Tsunami motorcycle, which has a wonderful, poignant story. And this is a bike that floated across the ocean, and a year and one month after the tsunami struck in Japan, it was found on an island off of the coast of British Columbia. And, you know, there's a lot of emotion wrapped up in that piece. Something else that's not to miss, for sure, is our board track display. Now these bikes were run on wooden tracks that had 45 degree steep banked angles. People didn't have brakes, they were slick with oil, and you can hit up to 100 miles an hour on the straightaways. So as you can imagine, a very harrowing experience. Harley-Davidson is one of those holdouts of our industrial heritage here in Milwaukee. A lot of these companies have come and gone, but we've really kind of stood the test of time. And it's something that I know a lot of people in the community are proud of to have here. 
Milwaukee played a central role in the growth and development of Harley-Davidson. I don't think the founders would have been able to do what they did if they hadn't been in Milwaukee. In fact, in the early part of the 20th century, Milwaukee was known as the machine shop of the world. Now the founders were working in a very small shed behind the, the Davidson family home. It was only 10 feet by 15 feet. But they had all of the resources that they needed, machine shops, tanneries, et cetera, right in their own neighborhood. So that really helped to facilitate what they were doing. Harley-Davidson, of course, stretches far beyond Milwaukee and has become a worldwide phenomenon. In fact, Harley-Davidson was in about 67 countries around the world by 1920. So we really spread our wings outside of the Midwestern United States very early on. And it's not just the fact that these bikes were sold, but the fact that people recognized the brand, people knew that there was something special about the brand, something that went beyond the tangible. We're the only American motorcycle manufacturer who's been around for 110 years. That's a pretty important thing. And it's something that we, we are looking to celebrate. We started our anniversary celebrations really with the 85th anniversary and have continued that tradition every five years. And 110 years, that's a real milestone. For people who are celebrating the 110th birthday of Harley Davidson, the museum is not to miss. The museum is really where all of the history is held. It's the spiritual home of, of Harley Davidson. And you know, it's something that's not to miss. There's so much to see here. People can participate. In fact, one of the uh, most popular exhibits here is a sit-on gallery, what we call the experience gallery, where people can throw a leg over a motorcycle, people who maybe have never even had the opportunity to do so. One thing I would want people to experience upon coming here is that it's not just about the motorcycle. There's so much to see here. There's so much that resonates with people from art history to graphic design to the history of technology. It's more than just a machine. To learn more, visit hdmuseum.com. Composer, conductor, genius, Mensch. Marvin Hamlish earned four Grammys, four Emmys, three Oscars, three Golden Globes, a Tony Award, and a Pulitzer Prize before his untimely death. Next, we hear from friends and family on how the genius worked. He was a genius because he could write these songs that were very pop kind of songs, and then, you know, we'd have a program and he'd sit there and play the piano, you know, like some great person. And you go, he knew that, that side of the, the world too, but yet and still he was able to do pop things, which is really not the norm. And so we knew that he was extremely talented. And the fact that he, you know, he was going to Juilliard <laughs> at such a, a young age, and we knew this was, this was big time. He was one of those people who, uh... You know, his intelligence uh, was so palpable, you know. You just looked at him, but to hear him uh, talk about anything for a few minutes, you knew how smart he was. You know, he was just way smarter than most of us. Again, I never worried about, I never worried about asking for something else because he never seemed very precious about what he was doing. I mean, he was, he's one of these sort of prodigies. He's got ideas sort of falling off of him. So it didn't, it never seemed to be a problem. It was sort of like, if you don't like this one, I got this one. You know, he's just very, he's very um, facile and, and, and quick. He could write so quickly and, and it was always pouring out of him like a gusher, right? So sometimes when these musical notes would come out, they would come out on airplanes. So he would be grabbing napkins, you know, from flight attendants and he'd be writing things. And one time I was in the bath and I looked over and there was a soap bar and I went to reach it and there was, there were all these notes. And I said, hey, hey, I think there's some music on the, uh, on the soap in here. Do, do you want this? Is this important? And I think if I'm correct, that it was the beginning of Anatomy of Peace you know, his symphonic work, it just, it came, now most of it was written on music paper and most of it stayed in his head and he didn't really have to write it down until he needed to because it was continually playing in his head. But he would, he just, it came pouring out of him, pouring out of him. So it'd be a sketch that he would write, 
I think much like Mozart or much like Verde, they would write a sketch of something and, and it would come out very, very quickly. So he would write a sketch of what he wanted and it would be very, very quick. And then it would unfold, I think, and develop into whatever it was. Marvin was one of the few musicians that could cross from Broadway to Hollywood to the concert stage, all right? He really is at the end of that family tree where he had Broadway success, Hollywood success, and then was able to transform, transform it into a live concert setting as well. And when you understand all those worlds, you are dealing with musicians of all ranges and calibers, some who read music, some who don't read music. And because he was thrust into really high power situations in Hollywood where you have to turn out things and have to be very precise, and then in the world of Broadway where you have to rewrite and write and the next day you're turning in a song and that's no good. He was used to deadlines. I mean, he had this combination and backed up with his classical training uh, to float among all those worlds. Simply because Marvin was a piano prodigy doesn't mean that he was locked to the piano. One of the great things about Marvin is his conducting skills, his orchestrational skills. Marvin was the complete musician. He didn't simply say, I'm a tunesmith and leave it at that. He, he made himself a schooled composer. Uh, and, and so really that's what puts Marvin in the category of Gershwin. It's not just he wrote these great tunes, or he wrote a great rock and roll song, or, or a great classic American melody. It's also that he understood the orchestra, and that he could, and that he understood the function of film music, and 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 could write it. He was the, and he could improvise, in 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 jazz styles. He was the complete musician. He knew his predecessor's music, and he was able to take what he learned of his studies of Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, Brahms, Schumann, and take those things and create his own musical tapestry. Most of us take those things and we try to understand them. He took them, got it, here's what I'm gonna do with it. His brain was operating at a much higher RPM than anybody else. Marvin was the frustrating, frustrating thing for Marvin was, was he could see something so clearly, especially when it came to music. He would, I, I mentioned earlier about when he was with, with uh, Barbara, how her question wouldn't be out of her mouth and he was already fixing it in the orchestra. It's because he could see things so, his mind worked so quickly and it was so, he was so connected to what had to happen that he would be frustrated by people not being as fast as him. His accomplishment, I think, is easy to, un his accomplishments are easy to underestimate. And all of this being said, it, he made it look easy, it was fun, but what was underneath it was consummate professionalism, extraordinary musicianship, the ability to, you know, to write down to the very last nanosecond of the downbeat, know what needed to happen musically, how the orchestra needed to work, what your performance needed to do. So you were inside a very clear sort of frame that was technical and smart and exact. But in there, you could have so much fun. And that's, um, that's a rare thing that doesn't always happen. It's that single-mindedness. It's almost childlike. It's almost ch childlike gift. You just, uh, it's, a kind of a, it's a kind of alertness that a bright kid has, and you can spot it a mile away. And uh, there it was in, in Marvin. And, uh, you, you, and think of what other people are like whom you meet. They're full of questions and idiocy, and you can't deal with them. And what's going to happen? How, I get, how I, do I get out of this? All that, all that sort of thing. With him, it, it's the opposite. You're just transfixed by it. It's like something coming out of a, like a star lands on the ground or something. <laughs> it's in, inexplicable, but it, it's, it happens. And it happens often enough so that it's something real. It's not just, it, it, it's there. It's what created the whole civilization. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. 
Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.